Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea conversation and we're going to be talking about culture by design, how to build a high performing culture. And who better to have this conversation with than the man who wrote the book himself, David Freeman, who is the CEO at Culture Wise. So how are you doing, David? I am fantastic, Chris. Great to be able to join you today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for the listeners out there, I'm, I'm part of a, of a leadership group called Vistage. David came in, did a, a wonderful talk. He had me on the edge of my seat the whole time. And during lunch, I was like, we got to get together and come on a podcast and talk about culture because you you had me really jacked up, really excited. So I, I'm, I'm really blessed that you, you're taking the time to share with us today. And maybe for our listeners out there, David, just get them started. So how do you actually define culture when you, you know, when you talk about that? Yeah, so it's probably the first thing for your listeners to understand, Chris, is that to me, if we understand how important culture is, and we'll we'll go deeper into this, I'm sure, in our conversation, you know, why culture is such an important thing, my point of view is that leaders should not leave culture to chance. Instead, we should be really purposeful about creating the culture we want because the culture influences everything. And yet it's so interesting how many leaders just sort of leave it by accident. The culture just happens instead of creating it. So when we talk about if we get that and we understand how critical it is to purposely create a culture, the starting point has to be the question you just asked, which is, all right, well, what the heck is culture? What is culture in general and how do we define it? So to me, the culture in an organization is really the set of behaviors that become the norms for how people operate in that, that group. And, and I say group because Every group of humans that comes together has a culture. You know, it isn't just companies. A, ch- a church has a culture. A family has a culture. A sports team has a culture. A group of friends of yours has a, a classroom has a culture. You put humans together and a culture is created, you know, even, even if it's by accident. And it's, it's that set of norms. You think about a group of friends of yours. There's just a way that you guys relate to each other. The, the accepted norms of behavior, to me, that's what the culture is. Um, right. It's what are the what are the accepted behaviors for how things get done in this group of people? That's right, and like you said, sometimes it's just natural. Whether it's a church or or a, I know you mentioned when we when you were were giving your talk about some uh, sports teams and the way the culture was around that. It's just it's naturally built into what's expected of others. Yeah, I mean, think about and, and you think about the impact of that. Uh, you know, one of the examples I think of often. I, I talk about high school sports, but if we take professional sports, we all know about, I think about Tom Brady who just retired and I actually can't stand Tom Brady. He's just, he's so amazing and he's so successful. Maybe that's what's so annoying about him. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, um, you know, you look at what he did when he went to Tampa Bay. So, you know, he spends all these years, 20 years in New England, goes to Tampa Bay and immediately the culture of Tampa Bay changes that just his sheer presence and the leadership that he provided, whether spoken or just by example, he set a tone that caused everybody around him him to say, we got Tom Brady on this team and I am not letting that guy down. And if Tom Brady is going to work after 20 years in the league as hard as he does and expect as much of himself and those around him as he does, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the one that's the, you know, the, the slackered. I'm going to live up to that standard. And it causes everybody on the team to raise their performance beyond what they might somewhere else. Right. And that's the real impact. And so you think about that and think about, so those same athletes, and these are, these are people at the top of their profession. These are professional athletes. Those people, you would, ex- you would think, if, if you didn't really consider this, you would think if they're that great, they're going to be great anywhere, aren't they? Well, they're not. They're different. Those same athletes are different playing when Tom Brady's on the team than some other quarterback, even though it's the same athlete because the culture affects everything. It does. And it also speaks, I guess, to the importance of the leader, right? Because, I mean, he came in, he took over as the leader. And from that, he he really directed the culture from there. Yes. And, And sometimes that's happening in a very intentional way. And sometimes it's happening accidentally. So even in a group of friends, there's a, there's a culture, there's, there's a, 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 a set of norms about how this group operates. And I, I think about it. Sometimes I talk about, you know, you picture your group of friends and you're trying to decide where to meet for dinner and what time. And somebody steps up and says, I got an idea. How about we all meet at Abby's bar and grill at six 30 tonight? Does that work for everybody? And everybody says, yeah, that, that's fine. And these leaders, they're the ones who there's always somebody like that who emerges just by their personality and they, they tend to 
they tend to influence. I was going to say dictate, but even if I tone that down and just say influence, they influence the norms of what's acceptable behavior in the group. How are we going to do things? And this happens in every group that comes together. Again, whether we're talking about a sports team like the like the, the, the Tampa Bay Bucks, or whether we're talking about a, a family or we're talking about a company like yours or mine, that there are leaders. And, and the reason that I always point this out to people is that when we understand that these leaders are influencing the culture, sometimes those leaders are fantastic Tom Brady kind of people and it elevates everybody around them. Mm. But sometimes they're not. Yeah. Sometimes the people with the strongest personalities, who, by the way, in a company aren't always the designated manager, supervisors, and leaders. They're just people who coincidentally happen to have a strong personality. If those people happen to be cynical jerks with lousy attitudes, and all of us have seen and worked around jerks before, those jerks will influence what's acceptable behavior in the group. Right. You know, there's the, the thug, the, the person in the classroom. When you think about when you were a kid, there was a big jerk in the classroom was the bully. And he or she kind of influenced how other people were because it was cool to be like that guy. Well, that happens in companies too. And, and the reason I, I like to point this out is that if we understand as a basic premise that the culture in that group of people has an enormous influence over the performance of that group of people, that's not something that leaders ought to leave that to the whims of whoever coincidentally happened to be the strongest personalities, that's something that leaders of organizations should take control over and create the culture they want instead of letting it just morph to follow whoever happened to be the strong personalities. That's right. That's right. Now, when I read, kind of piggybacking on that, when I read your books, one, one area that stood out, you were talking about a culture plan. So we'll have sales plans. You know, we have operation plans. We'll have all these processes, you know, everything, you know, spell, spelled out specifically on how the business runs, where we're trying to go in five years, three, five year plans, whatever they may be. But very rarely, I think it was a, a, where you said everybody started raising their hands. But when you get to the culture plan, all the hands went down because there's not a formal culture plan in place. So, I mean, is that that where it starts? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it starts with just understanding the importance of being planned about it. So, you know, what for, for the benefit of the audience, what Chris is referring to in my book, I talk about something. I, I do this in some workshops that I do. I don't always do it, but I'll do this thing where I'll, typically I'm in front of CEOs and I'll ask them, all right, on a one to five scale in terms of its impact on the bottom line, where would you rate culture? I mean, like, like, does this help you make money? Is this just a bunch of fluff or does it really help you make money? With one being, it's not that big a deal and five is, no, it's a really important contribution to the bottom line. And when I ask most CEOs, most of them will raise their hand and say, oh yeah, it, it's, this is you know, one of my top priorities. This is a four or five. And then I ask everybody, okay, so I, I get that. Let me ask you this. Do you, how many of you in this, in this room, if I'm in a room full of CEOs, I'll ask them, how many of you have some kind of a written documented strategic plan that identifies this year's targets, quotas, goals? You know, what do you need to achieve as a company? And almost everybody does. And then I ask them, you know, how many of you have some kind of a financial or, or a, a sales plan, how you're going to hit your sales numbers? And they all have that. And they all obviously have a, a financial plan, a budget, a forecast. And then I ask them, so how many of you have some kind of a documented culture plan? So how you're driving your company? your culture's company, your company's culture. And almost nobody does. And I say to them, well, that's kind of interesting. So you just told me this was a five in terms of its impact on the bottom line. I mean, we're talking about making money here and nobody's got a plan for it. This is that, that would be kind of like saying about our finances. Yeah, we don't need that budget thing. That's just, that's overrated. And if we didn't have a budget or a forecast, that doesn't mean, to be clear, that doesn't mean we wouldn't still be trying to generate as much revenue as we could or, or try to manage our expenses the best we could. But our chances of hitting our numbers would be a heck of a lot less if we had no plan. And yet here we have something called culture that we all say has this big contribution to the bottom line and very few people have a plan about it. And when I ask people then, you know, it kind of begs the obvious question, well, why not? Why don't we? You know, the answer for most is a couple of things. One is never thought about it like that, that they thought of culture as just this, you know, nice thing. Oh, we try to be nice to our people or we have pizza every Friday or we have, you know, a ping pong table in the reception area and they think that's culture. They just never thought about it as a core business process. The, and those few who have don't have any idea how to do it because to, it's easy to talk about hardcore 
traditional business disciplines. We can talk about finances. We can measure that. We could talk about, did we hit our sales number? And what are the activities we're going to do that are going to drive that sales number in the right direction? We could look at our operations and look at key metrics for throughput, for what are we getting out of our, you know, of our, our, our plant or whatever. So we can look at lots of metrics about that. But culture? Oh, that's just this squishy thing to people. And so because it's kind of squishy, we tend to avoid it. And yet it has the, it's probably the single biggest thing that has the most impact on the success of the organization. And most leaders don't spend enough time on it. You know, there's a thing that um, one of my favorite authors, uh, many of, of your listeners have probably read some of Patrick Lencioni's work. Uh, he's written the five dysfunctions, the, the five obsessions of a leader, the, the five the five dysfunctions of a team, the four obsessions of a leader, number of other um, books. And, and his books are great. And in his book, The Advantage, um, he talks a lot about this. The subtitle of the book is Why Organizational Health Trumps Everything Else in Business because it's that important. And he does this study of, you know, the, 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 you know why the health of the company is so important, et cetera. But the, the reason I raise this is he, he, he recognizes that the health of the company has more impact than any other thing that leaders can do. And then he does, he's kind of a research junkie and he does a tremendous amount of research and he looks at where do most CEOs spend most of their time on the typical normal business kind of things or on culture. Um, and most of them spend most of their time on the other stuff. So the thing that has the most impact on the organization is the culture of the organization. And yet most people spend most of their time on other things. And typically because this is an, this is an, a, a less defined area for most people. It's less concrete. It's hard to get our arms around this culture thing. It feels too squishy. So we, we gravitate toward the things we can put our arms around, yeah. which are finances, sales, operations, et cetera. Sure. I mean, and most CEOs are driven people. They, they're very successful for a reason. And when you put something gray or subjective in front of them, it, it, it can be a little bit harder to put your, your arms around. You know, so I, I can totally see where, where CEOs would struggle with this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, if I think about my core message, Chris, to, to leaders, it's that if we understand just how impactful our culture should be, we should be as process oriented about our culture as we are about our sales, finances, operations, and the other important parts of our business. That we should have that same mentality about it, that we should see culture, working on culture as a core business process, not as some fluffy HR thing. Right. Now, I think we just heard a collective sigh out of our listeners, Dave, because you finally, we connected to a process. I know we have a lot of process type listeners out there from an industrial standpoint. So maybe first steps in the process, where where, where do you even get started with, with defining that? Yeah. So when we talk about how to how to think of this as a process. In my books and in most of my workshops, I talk about a framework um, that I created many years ago in my first company for how to think about doing culture in a systematic, intentional way. And I call that framework the eight-step framework, eight different things that when leaders do these eight things, this is how you put some structure around working on our culture. And and I'll just I'll briefly touch on the eight things, but I, well, I'll also say for your audience sake is that while all of these eight steps are absolutely important and it does give us a way of thinking of this in a structured process oriented kind of way at the end of the day there are two of the eight steps that drive 80 or 90 percent of the impact all eight are important but there's two of them that really drive the biggest impact so let me just really quickly go through the eight steps sure just so that people have the context for this and then we can go deeper on the, the things that really drive the biggest impact mm -hmm. so the way i organize it if you could picture um, I, I usually will draw this as a circle with two steps in the middle and six things around the outer edges. So if your listeners can visualize a circle, the inner part of the circle are two steps that, that I think are the most important. The first is how we go about defining, well, what precisely is the culture that we're trying to create? Because if we don't define that clearly enough, we're not going to be able to build it. It would be like trying to you know, build a house with no plans. Well, we got a bunch of material. We'll see what we end up with. That'd be kind of dumb. If we need to know what it is that we're trying to create. So the first step is to define with enough clarity exactly what we want our culture to be. And we can talk more about that in a moment. The second step 
I call it creating rituals. And it's a critical step. And creating rituals, which we'll go deeper into, is about how do we make things last Because all of our listeners have had experiences, whether as leaders or simply participants in companies, where we've rolled out or had rolled out for our companies things we were excited about and and we knew were going to be important, and then they all fell by the wayside. We got busy. Life got in the way, and they fell by the wayside. Right. And we don't want that to happen. Creating rituals is all about how we make things sustainable. And so I'll talk more about that later. So the first two steps and the two that really have the biggest impact are defining the culture that we want with enough clarity and then creating rituals to sustain our practice. The other six steps, very briefly, step three is all about how do we select the right people who are going to be a fit for our culture? Because if we bring in people that aren't going to be a fit, it's not going to work. The fourth step is how we, I call it, integrate new people that we just hired into the organization. It's what some people call onboarding or orientation. How do you take the people you just brought in and how do you get them up and running and indoctrinated into your culture? The fifth step is all about how we communicate about our culture vis- visually and otherwise, all the different ways in which we can be constantly communicating with our people about our culture. The sixth step I call coaching. Coaching is all about how we use day-to-day situations and interactions customer issues, employee issues, vendor issues, and use our, cu- our culture as the lens through which we coach. How do we bring it into real life in everyday situations? The seventh step is all about what I call the leadership example. How do we make sure that we as leaders are good examples that we're demonstrating the culture that we want? And the eighth step is all about creating accountability for our culture. How do we show through performance reviews, surveys, and other methods How do we show people that we're not kidding? We're actually serious about this stuff because if there's no accountability, it's it's a waste. So so that's the eight-step framework. The two key things in the middle of that that circle that I described, defining our culture with enough clarity and creating rituals around how we teach it are the steps that probably account for 80% of the impact. But that's the big picture of how do we think about this in a more process-oriented way? Right. Let's go back and, and unpack those two areas that you talked about, you know, from a, from a defining and a ritual standpoint. So get us started with defining. With, how, how do you go about really leaning into that? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. And it's probably the most important step. So when we talk about how to define our culture, I would be willing to bet that nearly all of your listeners work in companies in which there is some set of traditional looking vision statements, mission statements, statements of core values. And and I want to say at the outset, at the risk of offending anybody, that most of the time, in my experience, those statements tend to be pretty fluffy, pretty nebulous, and they don't really bring enough clarity. And yet everybody has been through these exercises where we spend all this time writing these fancy statements and we put them on the wall and maybe we even have our people sign it because they were really serious about it. And then we all get back to work and get, get down to real business. You know, forget we got that stuff done. Now we can cross that box or check that box. Now we get real business yeah. to do. Now we got to catch up from everything we missed, right? <laughs> exactly. While we were spending days, you know, wordsmithing that stuff. So that's not what I'm talking about. When we talk about how to define our culture with enough clarity, I make a big deal about a language distinction between what I call values and what I call behaviors. And this is a really important distinction. It's subtle, but it's really important. A value to me is an abstract concept. Examples of values are things like quality, integrity, loyalty, respect, teamwork, innovation, service. These are ideas. (laughs) A behavior, in contrast, is an action. It's something you can see people doing. So some of the behaviors that I teach in my own organization, just to give you an example, are things like honor commitments. That's something people actually do. Practice blameless problem solving. Get clear on expectations. Be a fanatic about response time. These are actions that people do. So a value is typically an abstract idea where behavior is an action. The reason this distinction is really important and not just a bunch of semantics is that the problem in my experience with most companies' traditional looking core values is that because they're abstract, 
they mean too many different things to different people and they become hard to operationalize. What you mean by service might be very different than my definition of service. What you mean by respect might be very different than what I picture when I think of respect. We all have different notions of these vague words. At behaviors, because they're more action-oriented, are a lot easier to teach and coach and guide and give people feedback about. They're easier to operationalize. I always say it's very difficult to coach somebody about their core values, but I could coach them all day long about what I see them doing or not doing. Behaviors are very coachable. So the first step and the most important step in the whole process is to get enough clarity about what is the culture we're trying to create? What are the expectations we have for people? And to define them in clear behavioral terms so that everybody understands this is what it looks like to be successful here. So right. that's the first step and, and really the most important step. Because I mean, at that point, once you have those defined, like you said, as behaviors, you can sink your teeth into them. If you're an employee, that's 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 something that you can very, very cl clearly understand versus the, like you said, the poster on the wall that that really just, it, it doesn't it doesn't hit you directly. Yes. And, and it's interesting, Chris, how often when we roll this kind of work out in a company, the employees are, to your point, so appreciative and thankful for the clarity. We all want to know what to expect. What is it? What does success look like here? What is it you're looking for from me? And when you can give me a clear set of behaviors, great. I know what to be doing here. Um, yes. the, the, the values tend to be very frustrating for people. They are. They are. So I guess so. You when you take the, the behaviors now and you have those set of behaviors and however many they are listed out, and is it that point where you start working towards this ritual that you're talking about? Yes. So, so let's, let's define for your audience what a ritual is so that okay. they have some, some context for what we're referring to. So a ritual in the way that I use this word is some kind of a behavior that we do all the time. Um, it, you know, it could be, um, it could be if we get up in the morning, we brush our teeth. It could be, um, you know, we, before a ball game, we do the national anthem. Some people before a meal, they say a prayer. You know, we, we, when I was a kid in school, we used to say the pledge of allegiance each morning. They're just routines, things that we do all the time. Right. The reason that rituals are so important as a concept is that most people, and of course, remember that organizations are made of people, that most organizations by extension aren't very good. In fact, we stink, to be honest with you, at sticking with things. We come up with all these wonderful ideas, whether it's at home or at work, and we're really determined. We really are serious about this. And then life gets in the way and they fall by the wayside. When something becomes a ritual, it's not hard to do. If I use the example that, you know, some people before a meal, they say a prayer. That's just, that's just the routine. They don't have to, oh, shoot, I forgot to do it today. It just becomes part of the way we do things around here. So, that, so that's what a ritual is and why it's important. Now, the way we can leverage that simple thought is we take these behaviors in my own company and the companies that I teach, I give behaviors a name. It's just my own nomenclature. I call them fundamentals because they're fundamental to success. So think about in sports and music, we talk about, you know, working on our fundamentals. So I think fundamental is a good word for a behavior. So we create this set of fundamentals, these behaviors. We get it introduced into an organization in really interactive ways. And then we begin to focus on one fundamental every week through a series of rituals. So and I'll, I'll give you an example in just a moment. So week number one, imagine this. So as your, as your listeners are, are picturing this, picture in your company and imagine if all week long, everybody all over the company, no matter how many departments, locations you have, all week long, everybody's focusing and thinking about fundamental number one. This particular behavior has a heightened intensity this week. Next week, everybody's focused on number two. And the next week, number three and four, and we just keep cycling through them over and over again. So let me give you a simple example of a ritual to bring more clarity to this. So one of the rituals that I do in my company and, and most of our clients, actually all of our clients, not even most, all of them do the same thing, is that every time we have a meeting in our company, whether it's a project team meeting, a department meeting, a leadership meeting, every time we have a meeting in our company this week, the first agenda item of the meeting is the fundamental of the week. And we spend the first three or four minutes talking about it. So let me give an example. My fundamental in my company this week is one that we call share information. One of the things I hear from so many companies is a frustration that we don't communicate well enough around here. 
And what they usually mean is people don't get information out. We learn things. And, and, and often my experience is it's not because I'm like trying to hide information. It's just that you're busy doing your job and you're taking care of whatever you're supposed to do. You learn things and you go about doing your business. And most people don't stop and think, okay, is there somebody else who needs to know this or would at least benefit from knowing this? Should, do I need to tell sales about this? Do I need to tell operations? Do I need to tell the finance department about what I just learned? Like who else needs to know this? We just don't usually think about it. So it's really important in being effective as a group that as we learn things, we're thinking about, okay, who else needs to know this? And let me get that information out. So that's our fundamental this week. So every meeting that goes on in my company this week could be a project team meeting, a department meeting, sales meeting. It could be on Zoom or it could be you know in person. If there's a meeting going on in my company this week, every single one of those meetings, we start the meeting by spending a few minutes talking about sharing information. How do, could we do it better? Where do we do it well? Who's the best in our company at doing this? Where, where was a time that we forgot to share and what happened? And we just spent three or four minutes. We don't want to take over the meeting, just a few minutes. But every meeting is going to start with the discussion about sharing information. So as your audience members, as your listeners think about this, picture your company and imagine that anybody, that everywhere in your company this week, think about all the meetings that take place in your company this week. And imagine if in every single one of them, Every person spent a few minutes all talking about the exact same behavior. So we're all in the same one. And think about all the teaching that would be going on, all the, the awareness that would be going on about that behavior this week. And if we did that this week with, in my case, share information, and next week with our next fundamental, and the week after with our next one, and we just keep cycling through these over and over again, sooner or later, those behaviors start to become second nature. They just become how we think, how we do things around here. And that's what I mean by creating rituals. So I, I sometimes distill it, Chris, in this way. If I, to, to the, you know, I always like to distill things to their simplest essence. So for our listeners, if you think of it this way, if you want to get a group of human beings to behave in some consistent manner, whether that group of human beings is called your kids or it's called the athletes of the team you're coaching or the students in your classroom or the employees in your company. Doesn't it make logical sense, and it's just pure logic, that you would dramatically improve the probabilities of success? And I want to be really clear on this point. We don't control human behavior. People are weird. They do all kinds of things. We don't control them. So all we're doing is we're stacking the odds heavily in our favor. We're increasing the probabilities significantly. Doesn't it make logical sense that we would dramatically improve the probabilities of success if we were crystal clear about exactly what we expected of people, mm -hmm. except we're usually not. We just get annoyed when they're not being the way we want them to be, or we have vague notions of values that sound wonderful on the wall or look wonderful on the wall, but don't really bring enough clarity. Secondly, right. wouldn't we even be more likely to be successful if we not only were crystal clear about exactly what we expected of people, and at the same time, we had some structured, systematic way to teach those behaviors to people over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Right. Wouldn't that dramatically improve the probabilities that they would start to be the way we want them to be? That's really all the culture is. And, yeah. and yeah. it's that simple. If we did those two things, we're going to have a lot of success. Now, again, the, there are those other steps in the framework we talked about earlier. Sure, it helps if we bring in the right people. Because we're going to be a lot better off if we get people that are already natural, have a natural affinity to things we're trying to teach and promote. And it would be better if after we hired them, we integrated them into the company more successfully, et cetera, et cetera. But it, at the core of it, if all we did is we were crystal clear about what we wanted and we had a structured way to teach it over and over and over again, yeah. we'd be really successful. No and doubt. that's the simple concept. I love it. That, I mean, no doubt. That's wonderful. I, I am curious. Just from your experience, you work with a lot of companies. How long does it take before you really start getting the buy-in? Is this a three months, six months, like twelve months? I mean, where where do you see? Is there a tipping point, for instance, uh, on this? You know, of course, it varies depending upon the company, the size of it, the complexity, et cetera. But to give a general comment, first thing I would say is it happens way faster than people think. So sometimes you'll read articles or hear people say, well, you know, you got to understand culture change takes a long time, takes years. Not my experience. This doesn't have to be that hard. 
Um, and so we see changes rapidly. I would say there are two things that happen almost immediately. And when, when we're helping companies, they can, we can take them through a process to think of their fundamentals, create them, roll it out to their people and start practicing them usually in a 30 to 60 day period. So the, so the wow. process of, of getting them started takes 30 to 60 days. This is not a, oh my God, we got to spend the next year or two working on this. Right. I mean, we're going we're gonna to work on it forever, but to get it launched is a 30 to 60 day process. Now, once they've launched, and we talk about, so how long to get to your question, how long to see impact? There are two things that happen almost immediately. The first thing that happens, and this is important, is people's language changes. Mm -hmm. They begin to adopt the language of the fundamentals. They'll, you'll hear people even half jokingly saying, hey, remember that was fundamental number four. And that's okay. That means it, it's, they're thinking about it. Right. And language is really important. It's interesting. I, I did a survey of our clients a uh, number of months back where I asked them about what's, what are the biggest impacts they've seen of practicing fundamentals? And the number one thing that people mentioned, and this doesn't surprise me, but it may surprise your audience, is they said the power of a common language. When we're all speaking the same language, when we know what it means to honor commitments or to practice blameless problem solving or to speak straight or to listen generously, when we're all using the same phraseology, it has enormous impact, huge. Yeah. And, and that happens almost immediately. Uh, just slight tangential comment about this, but I think it, it adds context for this. There was a guy I worked with many years ago was a consultant that taught me a lot about communication. And he, he hits an interesting analogy, at least as I remember it. And he said that, imagine, picture your company. And so as, as listeners, uh, think about your company. Imagine if everybody in the company came from a different country and they all spoke another language. So we come into work and I grew up in Germany. I'm making this up. I grew up in Germany. I didn't really, but and I, I speak German when I come to work. And Chris, you grew up in uh, Italy and you speak Italian. Somebody else speaks Spanish and somebody else speaks Swahili. And, and it'd be really hard to communicate effectively because we all speak different languages. And that's kind of what it's like because we all grew up in different families and different backgrounds where things meant different things. Now imagine that we said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. No matter where you grew up, it doesn't matter. When you come into our office, we all speak Japanese in this office. And so it doesn't matter. I don't really care where you grew up. This is what we speak. It'd be a lot easier to communicate. It doesn't matter what the language is. But if we all spoke the same language, it'd be a lot more effective. So creating a set of fundamentals to define our culture gives us a common language to speak. And it makes our ability to communicate and connect with each other so much more powerful and people always discover this afterwards. It's not something they anticipate, but it's one of the biggest impacts people see afterwards. And, 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 and in, a, in a very practical way, one of the ways, one of the many ways in which that common language is so powerful and so impactful is that it, it makes coaching conversations less confrontational. In other words, you know, if I go to you, Chris, and say, man, I can't believe you screwed that thing up again and you're feeling all defensive and why are you always picking on me and we all get angry. If instead I say, you know, Chris, one of the things, remember, we always talk about practicing blameless problem solving here. So let's talk about what we need to do in this situation to fix this and to learn from it. Now the conversation is about the principle. It's not about you and me. It's about the principle. So it, it makes coaching conversations far less personal. There's a set of principles that we've all agreed to for how we're going to operate around here. And we're just referencing the principle. So th that, that, that language, so back to your original question, you know, what is it that, that, what are the impacts? First thing that happens is people's language changes and that's really powerful. The second thing that happens rapidly, almost right away is that people begin to handle situations differently today than they would have a week or two ago because they're using their fundamentals to respond. So uh, I'll, I'll use the example that I just referenced a moment ago, a fundamental that's in every one of our clients because it's so important. I call it practice blameless problem solving. You know, let's not focus on who screwed up. Let's just fi fix the problem and then let's learn from it and make sure that we've incorporated process improvement with all your engineers, process improvement so big, how do we take what we learned and improve our process from it? So you're going to see a situation right after we roll out the fundamentals, a situation is going to come up where a problem occurred and, and teammates are going to say to each other, 
hey, remember, let's practice blameless problem solving right now. And all of a sudden, they're now handling that situation differently than they might have two weeks before that. And that stuff happens immediately. And then it just builds from there. So I hear people get back to us 30 days in and they can't believe how much change has happened already. So this does not take a long time. That's wonderful. I mean, great examples right there. You know how to tie together. I love the common language that you can even tie that back to your sports analogy earlier, way, way back. I mean, the best sports teams, they, they speak the same language. They're on the same wavelength. They, you, when you call that plays, it can be very complex, but when you all understand the language and you're working towards a common goal, it just makes it, it all comes together. So Dave, this has been a, just a wonderful conversation around culture and so much that you've unpacked here. I'm sure for our listeners, Go back and rewind, take notes because there, there, there was so much that David brought. So maybe wrap it all up together for us here. David on Eco asked why we always wrap up with the why, you know, so why was focusing on building that high performing culture so critical to a, to a future success in business? You know, I, I, the way that I think of it, um, Chris, is that it, it comes back to the culture in any organization has an, and again, remember organization is groups of people. Doesn't have to, could be a company, could be any group. That the culture has this enormous influence over everything that happens. People will perform differently in different organizations. Listeners, as you think about your company, if, if people left your company and they went to a different company doing the same thing, they would perform differently because they're in a different environment. So the environment, that culture, and that's really all culture is, it's just the environment, the the set of norms that that dictate how we do things, that environment has an enormous influence over everything that happens. So if we understand that, the obvious logical conclusion from that is, if I'm a leader, if there was a way that I could purposely create the environment that would help my people to perform at a higher level, everybody's a winner from that. And we ought to be creating that instead of leaving it to chance. That's right. Absolutely. Well, David, this has been, again, so much that you unpacked here. For the listeners, check out the show notes. There will be all sorts of ways to connect with Culture Wise. David, I'll see all the wonderful things he's doing. Check out his two books. The, the links will be in there as well. We definitely highly recommend those to those leaders out there in the industry. And, David, thank you for sharing so much today on Eco Ask Why. Totally my pleasure, Chris. Great to be with you. Yes, sir. You have a great day. What a powerful conversation with David. You may have to go back and listen to this one several times to get all the areas that he unpacked. But I tell you what, those eight, those, that eight structure that he talked through, so much value there. So really, we dug a lot into the design area and the rituals and creating those fundamentals. And I just love how he says it values versus behaviors because it's really all about the behaviors. What do we do day in and day out? That defines the culture. So check out the show notes. There's tons of information right there that you'll be able to connect with David, the wonderful things he's building, and he may be able to help you get the culture that you desire moving forward. Now for the war stories, keep them coming. We've we got a few co- that have come out already and we're getting great feedback. We want the good, the bad, the funny, the stuff you guys just enjoy telling around the, the, the dinner table as well as uh, around the water, water tank at work, whatever it takes. We just want to get the story so we can share with others because it's all about, you know, just bringing our community together. Now, if you're liking Eco Ask Why, we ask that you share this with someone else. So take your phone out right now. If you're at your computer watching this on YouTube, go ahead and just forward that link over, send an email out and get it to other people because this is how we're going to grow the community. We, we want Eco Ask Why to grow and bless others. So tell you what, guys, you know, give us a five star rating, write a review. All that makes a big impact. So I hope you enjoyed it. Go work on that culture. And remember, keep asking why.